The vision of a fighter is your classic archetypal hack and slash class. The problem is that in D&D 5e, it does have a little bit of a perception of being kind of boring or bland, but I really don't think it actually needs to be that way. The fighter actually does have a significant amount of depth and versatility if you really kind of look into it and get a great understanding for the class. Whether you are brand new to D&D or you're just looking for a refresher for the fighter class, this is going to be the video for you. We're going to go into the basic creation process and get a good in-depth understanding of what all the actual the, the basic features are for the fighter. In this video, we're not going to be covering or exploring any of the subclasses that exist for it, the martial archetypes. We are just going to be staying focused on the, the fighter class as a whole. If you have not already, please do consider subscribing to the channel. It does sincerely help me grow and, and know what types of content you guys actually want to see on the channel. But without too much further ado, let's just get on into it. All right, so we're looking at the base fighter straight out of the player's handbook here. Uh, we do get some information right off the bat that if you are multi-classing into a fighter, you do have to have either a strength or dexterity score, not both, one or the other score of 13 or higher. We're not going to be going into multi-classing. This is just really just for your knowledge of that. It's something that you're interested in doing. So here we're going to look at the progression table for the fighter. This gives us an idea of what the, the basic features and the new things that we're going to be acquiring as we level up. The fighter class as a whole isn't really reliant on, on a, a significant amount of abilities, save for a, a few certain subclasses, but they really kind of heavily focus on the few abilities and the few features that they have progressing and getting better over time, and that's something that we'll see throughout the course of this video. So if you look at the beginning here, starting at first level, our proficiency bonus is plus two. If you are unsure about exactly what a proficiency bonus is, please do check out my video on the D&D character sheet explain. I go into a significant amount of depth there to really get a good understanding for yourself. Your proficiency bonus will start at plus two, and if you do somehow manage to get all, get all the way to the end game, it will top out at a plus six. Looking at the starting features that we have, you get a fighting style and a second wind. We will be exploring those in just a minute. Uh, but I just want to give a good understanding of how to read this table. It's not particularly complicated. The spellcaster ones are a little bit more uh, convoluted. But as we can see, as you level up, you will begin to learn new things. At second level, you get something called action surge. At third level, you get your martial archetype, which is what the subclasses are called for the fighter. At fourth level, we'll get an ability score improvement as well as a martial versatility, which is a optional uh, feature that was, uh, was implemented with Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. We're not going to go in depth and read every single one of this, these levels through the table. It's all pretty self-explanatory and all the, the uh, specific features are explained down below. So we're going to move on straight into that. All right, starting out with the class features, if we begin with the uh, hit points and your hit dice, your hit dice as a fighter is 1d10. The hit dice that you have is always decided by the class that you are, and this, uh, as a fighter, you have a 1d10 as your hit dice, which means that at, at first level, you'll be starting at 10 hit points plus whatever your constitution modifier is, and whenever you take a short rest, you can roll a hit dice to regain a certain amount of hit points, and that hit dice, again, will be your d10. Moving on to the proficiencies that we have. So you are, prof you are proficient with all armor and shields as a, uh, as a fighter. In addition, you are proficient with both simple weapons and martial weapons. You're not proficient with any tools as standard. You are proficient in strength and constitution saving throws. And you get to choose two skills from acrobatics, animal handling, athletics, history, insight, intimidation, perception, and survival. The two that you're going to choose are really going to be based on your sort of your vision for your character. What what you, you, you've, you've decided that their background is and the kind of character that you're trying to build and create. Not all fighters necessarily have to be your classic knight with your sword and shield in hand. Some might lean more towards an archery style. Some could be kind of brigands that have made their way out. and They don't necessarily need to be proficient in the same types of things depending on the type of character that you're trying to build and what that vision you have for them is. As for your starting equipment, you get to choose uh, four different things and you have a couple of choices. You can either have a chainmail or uh, leather, longbow, and 20 arrows. Uh, chainmail obviously give you a much higher starting uh, armor class, but again, that is going to be dependent on the type of character that you want to be. Uh, your second choice is either a martial weapon and a shield, or you can have two martial weapons, and that will kind of come into play again, depending on the type of character that you want to build and the type of fighting style that you're going to be choosing, and that's something that we will take a look at in just a second. You can also choose either a light crossbow and 20 bolts, or two hand axes, and your last choice would be either a dungeoneer's pack or an explorer's pack. Those are things that just have uh, very specific types of adventure and gear that might come in handy. All right, moving on to the fighting style. At first level, you do get to choose one fighting style of your choice from this list. So it says that you adopt a particular style of fighting as per your specialty. 
Choose one of the following options. You can't take a fighting style option more than once, even if you get to choose later again. So you will have opportunities to get another fighting style, you, and what this is saying is that you cannot double up on it. So for example, if you look at the first one, the archery fighting style says you get plus two to attack rolls made with ranged weapons. If you get an opportunity to take a second fighting style, you cannot take archery again and double down on that and now have plus four to your attack rolls with ranged weapons. Next fighting style you get to choose is blind fighting. It says you have blind sight with a range of 10 feet. Within that range, you can effectively see anything that isn't behind total cover, even if you are blinded or in darkness. Moreover, you can see an invisible creature within that range unless the creature successfully hides from you. This can be an incredibly clutch uh, fighting style to choose. Probably isn't one you're going to be taking as your first, depending on the nature of your campaign, I guess that is. However, I actually have had a player in one of my campaigns make exceptional use of the blind fighting style. And uh, it can be really difficult to, to work around as a DM, but uh, it's an incredible option with a lot of flavor behind it. Next option we have is defense. It says while you are wearing armor, you gain a plus one bonus to AC. So on top of whatever the standard AC bonus you get from your armor is, you get an additional one by choosing the defensive fighting style. Next up is dueling. It says while you are wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, you get plus two bonus to attack rolls with that weapon. So very importantly to note that is not to damage rolls, that is just when you are rolling to hit and you specifically have to be wielding a melee weapon in one hand. It cannot be a two-handed weapon. Very importantly, it also only applies to you while you are holding a melee weapon in one hand. It cannot be a two-handed weapon, and you cannot have another one-handed weapon in your other hand. You must have a free second hand. Next up is great weapon fighting. So when you roll a one or two on a damage die for an attack that you make with a melee weapon that you are wielding with two hands, you can re-roll the die, but you must use a new roll, even if the roll is a one or a two. The weapon must have the two-handed or versatile property for you to gain this benefit. So in this... So this is an incredibly powerful feature that does let you re-roll some pretty poor damage dice, which is always awesome. But the qualifier is that it must be a two-handed weapon or a weapon with a versatile property. A weapon with a versatile property means that it is one that you could wield in either one or two hands. And and typically you will get additional damage for holding it in two hands anyway. Something like a Warhammer is an example of a versatile weapon that typically has 1d8 damage, but if you're holding with two hands, you get 1d10 damage. And this kind of allows you to double down on that. If you roll poor on that damage dice, you get to re-roll it. Next up on the list is Interception. When a creature you can see hits a target other than you within five feet of you with an attack, you can use your you can use your reaction to reduce the damage to the target takes by 1d10 plus your proficiency bonus to a minimum of zero damage. You must be wielding a shield or a simple martial weapon to use this reaction. So this is a little bit more on the complicated side, but it's really the, the vision of your fighter being the protector for your party. If you are standing right next to a party member who is about to take a couple uh, a couple slashes from an enemy soldier or any type of enemy with a, that's going to be making a melee attack, this is kind of like you slamming your weapon in the way or, or your shield in the way and then kind of being able to deflect and reduce some of that damage that your party is going to take. Obviously, this does consume your reaction, so it would prevent you from doing other things that, that require that, such as, uh, uh, such as taking an opportunity attack. Next up on the list is protection, kind of similar to the, the previous one, interception, but it says when a creature you can see attacks a target other than you that is within five feet of you, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll. You must be wielding a shield. So again, very, very similar kind of uh, trait. You are just kind of like swinging your arms in the way or your, your shield in the way to try and kind of block or deflect it. Uh, this imposes disadvantage on the roll, which sometimes can be better than reducing damage, just kind of depending on uh, the nature of the creature and what their hit modifier is and all those kinds of things. Next up is called Superior Technique. You learn one maneuver of your choice from among those available to the Battle Master archetype. If a maneuver you use requires your target to make a saving throw to resist the maneuver's effects, the saving throw equals to 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your strength or dexterity modifier of your choice. You also gain one uh, superiority die, which is a d6. The die is added to any superiority dice that you have from another source. The die is used to fuel your maneuvers. A superiority die is expended when you use it. You, uh, you regain any expended superiority dice when you finish a short or long rest. So this one kind of gives you a little bit of a flavor of being a battle master uh, archetype, even if you don't take the battle master martial uh, archetype for the fighter. If you're uh, the champion, um, if you're a champion or if you take the 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 psi, the psi warrior, you can still get aspects of these maneuvers which are actually incredibly powerful and can be really, really clutch in a lot of different ways. 
Alternatively, if you are a battle master, you can just get an extra maneuver and also have an extra superiority die to use with it. Next up on the list is Throne Weapon Fighting. It says you can draw a weapon that has the Throne property as part of the attack you make with the weapon. In addition, when you hit with a ranged attack using a Throne Weapon, you get plus two bonus to the damage roll. This is kind of nice. Throne weapons are not that commonly used, at least not in my campaigns, but I've never seen anyone take this uh, feature in particular. Next up, we have two weapon fighting. This is when you engage in two weapon fighting, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the second attack. So typically, if you have two weapons in your hand and you make one attack and an offhand attack, the second attack with your offhand does not get your ability score modifier to it. So for example, if you had your two swords, your second attack is just the d6 or the d8 dice. You do not add your ability modifier the same way you do with the first attack. However, taking this fighting style does allow you to add your, either your strength or your dexterity modifier to that second attack. It can be a really nice bonus of damage, especially if your strength or dex is already at plus four or plus five. That's really not an insignificant amount of extra damage that is always flat and consistent. Lastly, we have unarmed fighting. Your unarmed strikes can deal bludgeoning damage equal to 1d6 plus your strength modifier on a hit. If you aren't wielding any weapons or a shield when you make the attack roll, the d6 becomes a d8. At the start of each of your turns, you can deal 1d4 bludgeoning damage to one creature grappled by you. So this has some, some great elements of flavor here. You get a little bit of a peek at kind of like what, what a monk feels like. Uh, and it's really kind of emphasizing more of that like brawler aspect to being a fighter, which is kind of fun. It's got a lot of flavor to it, which is really cool. All right, so we are not going to look at the last three because they are Unearthed Arcana, so they're not really tested uh, thoroughly, and they have not been officially printed, so we are just going to skip over those. Next up, also at first level, you get a feature called Second Wind. It says you have a limited well of stamina that you can draw on to protect yourself from harm. On your turn, you can use a bonus action to regain hit points equal to 1d10 plus your fighter level. Once you use this feature, you must finish a short or long rest before you can use it again. This is a great way for fighters to have some sort of uh, self-reliant healing without having to consume potions or rely on a cleric to be able to kind of heal them uh, in the midst of battle. Being able to do it as a bonus action and it scales up with your with your fighter level over, over time is really, really handy. It's really convenient. It's not necessarily the most reliable amount of, of health uh, since it is you are rolling for it. It's a d10. But as it does increase over time, you know, if you, if you reach, you know, ninth or 10th level, you're adding that base level of healing. It can be worth a good 15, 20 healing pretty consistently. So it's a nice feature just to kind of really help you stay on the front lines a little bit longer. All right, so next up is one of the most iconic features and powerful features for the fighter, and it's called Action Surge. So starting at second level, you can push yourself beyond your normal limits for a moment. On your turn, you can take one additional action. Once you use this feature, you must finish a short or long rest before you can use it again. Starting at 17th level, you can use it twice before a rest, but only once on the same turn. So Action Surge is huge. This allows your fighter to do an incredible amount of damage on just one single turn. And the reason for that is because it pairs incredibly well with the extra attack feature, which is one that we will be discussing in a minute. A very important note about action search is that you get an extra action, you do not get an extra turn. So what this means is that you do not get an additional movement unless you choose to use that action to use the dash action. You do not get an extra bonus action, you only get to take an extra action, which can be used to, to take any of the normal combat actions like dodge, disengage, dash, uh, to, to attack, to cast a spell, interact with an object, any of the base uh, combat actions you can use, you can choose to use your second action with. At third level, you get to choose your martial archetype. As I said, we are not going to be discussing this uh, in this video, but there's a ton of variety and a ton of different flavors. So whatever class, whatever type of fighter that you're trying to build, you will definitely have an opportunity to do that. So take a look, go through some of these and figure out whichever one looks best for you. Next up is the ability score improvement. And what is unique to fighters with uh, in regard to these is that you actually will get seven ability score improvements as opposed to every other class, which only gets five. This is a huge, huge difference because not only does it mean that you get extra opportunities to maybe improve some, some weaker stats or really kind of top out the ones that you're reliant on, but you also get extra opportunities to take extra feats, which can make the fighter an incredibly versatile and powerhouse at later levels. Also, and in addition to your ability score improvements, something else that was introduced with Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is this martial versatility feature. It says whenever you reach a level in that class that grants an ability score improvement feature, you 
can do one of the following as you shift your focus of your martial practice. You can replace a fighting style you know with another fighting style available to fighters. If you know any maneuvers from the Battlemaster archetype, you can replace one maneuver you know with a different maneuver. This is great and allows a lot of flexibility because typically rules as written, once you picked a fighting style, you had no way of changing it. You were stuck with it. So this kind of gives you an opportunity to, to develop your character into a different way. Maybe they changed the way the fighting. Maybe it just didn't work out the way that you thought it was. It wasn't as fun as you expected it to be. So it gives you a lot more flexibility with the way that you can change your character up uh, in the middle of the game. All right, next up is the extra attack feature. And this is kind of the bread and butter of uh, your fighter class. So it says, uh, beginning at fifth level, you can attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action on your turn. The number of attacks increases to three when you reach 11th level in this class and four when you reach 20th level in this class. All right, so as I said before, the extra attack is really the bread and butter of the fighter class. It's where tons of your damage is really going to be raining down. That said, there are a couple things that are really important to note about extra attack, and that is in order to take an extra attack, you must have taken a first attack. And that sounds super obvious, but it isn't necessarily. So what I mean by that, though, is that in order to get the benefit of the extra attack feature, you have to have taken the attack action. What this means is that you cannot have taken the cast a spell action and then attack because you have an extra attack. You cannot have dodged and then take an attack because of your extra attack feature. You have to have attacked and then you can use the attack, the extra attack feature on top of that. So the reason that this is so powerful is because it does grow over time. So you can attack twice at first level, you can attack three times at 11th level, and you can attack four times at 20th level. And that doesn't really sound amazing, but being able to have all these extra attacks is actually incredibly powerful, especially at higher levels. You'll be raining down so much damage on each of your strikes. But as I said before, this pairs incredibly well with Action Surge. So if you were an 11th level fighter and you attack three times on one turn, you could then spend your Action Surge and attack three additional times for a total of six attacks. Obviously at 20th level, you're gonna be making eight attacks, but not too, too many games are actually going to go that far, but 11th level is not unrealistic. And to be able to have six consecutive attacks on one turn, obviously you can only do it once per short rest because of the action surge recharge, but that's insane. That's an incredible amount of damage. And even just the consistency of being able to pump out three attacks on every single turn is just phenomenal. So the last feature that we get as a fighter is Indomitable. It says, beginning at ninth level, you can re-roll a saving throw that you fail. If you do so, you must use the new roll, and you cannot use this feature again until you finish a long rest. You can use this feature twice between long rest starting at 13th level and three times between long rest starting at 17th level. So as I mentioned before, Fighters really rely on these on these features that kind of scale and improve over time. Being able to re-roll a failed saving throw can be incredibly clutch, especially at high levels where the, the traps and the things you're trying to get away from can be incredibly lethal. So having this opportunity to re-roll these saving throws, especially three times potentially, depending on how far your game goes, can be incredibly clutch. All right, so that is it. That is a look at the fighter class for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. I do sincerely hope you, you enjoyed this video and got something of value out of it. Please let me know in the comments down below, what's your favorite martial archetype for the fighter? What's your favorite feature for them? Remember to like and please do subscribe as well. It does sincerely help as I mentioned before. But other than that, take care.